welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, tonight we're going to get into the word of the Lord. And listen, you didn't come to hear from me. Oh, thank God, because I don't have anything to say. Didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, the young or the old, the black, the brown, the white, any other color we could imagine, the tall, the short. No, listen, it's not about men and their understanding. It's about us coming together and hearing from the word of the Lord. So if you would do this, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord tonight in prayer. Father, tonight, truly, it's good to be in your presence, good to be in your house. God, as we come together and open up your word, God, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. May we have hearts that are good ground. May we have a good understanding. Hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church tonight. God, come and give grace to the hearer. Lord, lead us, teach us, guide us, guard us, direct us. Motivate us, Lord. Heal us, God. Give us the instruction, the wisdom, the vision, even the correction and the discipline that we need for each and every one of our lives, God. Lord, how awesome and how wise you are that you can speak a right now word to every individual in this place on their level, Father God. We thank you, Lord. That's just awesome. We don't understand how that works, God, but we praise you that you still do that, God. Lord, tonight, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. God, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat and get your Bibles out tonight. We're going to 1 Samuel chapter number 21. 1 Samuel chapter number 21, and tonight we're talking about the fuel of life, the fuel of life. 1 Samuel chapter number 21. Now, let me give you a little bit of backstory. Here is David. Here David comes, and uh, he has now befriended Jonathan, who is the king's son, King Saul. His son Jonathan has befriended David. Now, uh, David has had his victory over Goliath. They've been singing his praises. He's like the rock star of Israel. And now David has is, is been anointed king. He knows that he's headed that direction. And it seems like now that he's headed that direction, some good things are taking place. But uh, there's some other things that are happening that, that are troubling. As he continues to get elevated, he keeps having victories and keeps having things go good for him. But it seems like the more victory he has and the, the further he goes up, the more that King Saul just does not like David anymore. King Saul hates David now. King Saul put out a challenge uh, for David to, to marry his daughter, wanted his daughter to be a snare to David, and, and David just wouldn't do it for the longest. And then Saul puts out a challenge that seems impossible and thought for sure David was going to die, and David ends up taking on the challenge, doing everything that he needs to do. He doesn't die. In fact, he kind of gives it back to Saul, like, hey, here you go. This was impossible. I did it. Now give me your daughter, you know, and he's all excited, so he gets married. And, and now he's married, and, and he's, he's in covenant now. He's in a, in a, in a binding agreement, a close a covenant relationship. This is the closest, most solemn and sacred of all kinds of relationships with Jonathan, the king's son. The king comes to Jonathan and says, what are you doing? You know, here's David. He's getting elevated. He's been anointed. He's going to be king in your place. He's taking your kingdom. You should be mad at him. You should not like him. And so Jonathan goes to David. They're talking. And David, you know, is running around trying to stay away from Saul. And he runs away. And then he comes back. And, you know, for a while Saul's good. And then, then Saul starts getting troubled again, tries to pin him to a wall with a spear. All this kind of stuff is going on. And, and in the midst of all this turmoil, David turns to his wife. And, and they find him there. Then he turns to the prophet. And they come looking for him there. And then we find that David goes to Jonathan and says, Jonathan, hey, listen, your dad just wants to kill me. He says, no way. No, not my dad. And so they put out this thing where he's going to have dinner. And he tests his dad to figure out whether or not King Saul is really trying to kill David or not. Finds out he is. And so Jonathan sends David away and says, listen, you got to go. My, my, my father, the king, he wants to do you harm, and so you got to get out of here. And after a very touching time where they uh, just embrace one last time and, and, and have one last covenant agreement together that David's going to be good to Jonathan's family after him, David leaves the presence of Jonathan. It's here that we pick up the story in 1 Samuel, chapter number 21, starting in verse number 1, and we'll read through verse number 6. 1 Samuel, chapter 21, starting in verse... Number one says this, now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? See, he knew something was up when he saw David walking up by himself. Verse two, so David said to Ahimelech the priest, the king has ordered me on some business and said to me, do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you. 
which I have commanded you, and I have directed my young men to such and such a place. So ba David basically tells him a story to get him off the scent, you know. Didn't want to let him know that he was fleeing from the presence of Saul. So he pretended like, okay, well, I, I've got this top secret mission, okay. We don't have time to get into the, the morality of that or not. Verse 3. Now, therefore, what you have on your hand, give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. Verse number four, and the priest answered David and said, there is no common bread on hand. There is holy bread, if the young men have at least kept themselves from women. Verse five, then David answered the priest and said to him, truly women have been kept from us about three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. Verse six, so the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was, was taken away. Now, for us, we don't really understand what's going on here. So let me give you some background, and then let me shoot forward to the future, and then we'll come back to the present story that we're taking a look at. Background of this is that in the holy tabernacle, okay, this was the place that hosted God's presence behind the veil. The priests had daily ceremonies, weekly ceremonies, things that they had to do. Part of that was that they had a table. It was a small table, and it had 12 pieces of bread, six on each side. And this was representative of the tribes of Israel, and this was called the table of showbread. It was, uh, or also it was called the bread of the presence. In other words, this bread was supposed to be set before the Lord, and, and it was signifying a communion. You know, we, we have communion today. We understand the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was similar in the, in the sense that there was bread in the presence of God, the 12 tribes of Israel, or the body of that nation was now present in front of the Lord. And every week they had to set a new fresh bread out in front of the Lord, and they would take that old bread, and the book of Leviticus tells us that the priests were to eat it. Now, one of the things that I thought was interesting was that if you fast forward to the future now, here's Jesus with his disciples, they're walking through the fields, and the disciples are grabbing grains, rubbing them in their hands, and then eating the kernels of wheat afterwards. And the Pharisees get all just incensed. They are so angry, and they can't believe that these disciples are doing this because it's a Sabbath day. It's supposed to be a holy day, right? And so they start to yell at Jesus, and they say, why are you letting your disciples do that which is unlawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus' answer to them is, hey, didn't you ever read your Bible? Now, that was really throwing something in their face because the Pharisees prided themselves in their knowledge of the Bible. So they're like, yeah, we read the Bible, you know. And so they're all, you know, getting angry and hot in the face and all that kind of stuff. And Jesus, Jesus said, well, if you read your Bible, you'd know that David went into the temple and he ate the showbread and gave to his young men who were with him. And so what Jesus is saying, he's saying, listen, this was approved of by God. This King David, not yet king, running from the presence of Saul, going into the temple and asking for bread. Now, this bread was set aside for the priest, and yet in the Old Testament, it never said only the priest could eat it. So they never overstepped the command of the Lord. The priest were to eat it, but it, it never said that the priest couldn't use it for the needs of others. Are you listening? That's why Jesus said that we should look at the law, we should adhere to the law, but we, we need not neglect the weightier matters of the law like righteousness, justice, and mercy. See, the priest was being merciful to David and allowing him this bread, which was supposed to be for the priest, but he said, okay, you know, there, there is no common bread here, so here is the holy bread. And so he allowed him to eat it. When these Pharisees would have said, that's not lawful, no one can, the king can't eat this bread, this bread is set aside for the priest. But Jesus said, this is something that is okay. I find it interesting as I look at this story that David was in a very tumultuous time of life. David was in a very confusing time in life. Everything that he knew, everything that he had established, everything that he had done, everything that he had built was now being taken away. It was like the rug was being pulled out from underneath his feet. Wind was taken out of his sails. He, he was being elevated. He was rising up. He was having all this success God was obviously on his side that he could do the things that he had done, take out the giant, take out Philistines, you know, do all these great exploits. People were singing his praises, and yet everything crumbled right around him. I don't know tonight how you came in. Maybe you feel the same way coming in here. 
You know, maybe when Cameron was up here saying somebody just got a pink slip, somebody just got a bad report on their health, somebody just got a big bill, somebody just made a commitment they don't know how they're going to keep it. See, I don't know how you came in. Maybe you feel like David. But I've got encouraging news for you tonight, and that is, is that the word of the Lord is a fuel to our life. That as we get into church, we get into the presence of God now, we can get a hold of the fuel of life. And God doesn't want us to just get by. God doesn't want us running on E, if you will. God wants us to have a power-packed, power-filled life. God wants us to have direction. God wants us to have vision. God wants us to have purpose and live up to our potential. Are you listening tonight? And so tonight, I want to just pull a couple of things from this story about the fuel of life. The fuel of life. There's a couple of things we're going to learn, a couple of things we're going to take away from the story tonight that are going to help us to figure out, you know what, I came in this way, but you know what, what am I going to do come, going forward? What am I going to do about this situation? How am I going to handle life? Even though the stuff may have hit the fan, if you will. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Even though that may have happened, God still says, lift up your eyes. Be of good cheer. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. God says you're a winner. You're an overcomer. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. God says you are valuable. You are worth my blood. I will give you the power of the Spirit to accomplish it. See, God says you can do it. You just need to tap into the fuel of life. So the fuel of life, number one tonight, is know your need. Know your need for fuel. Here's King David running on E, right? And you know what I mean when I'm talking about it. I'm talking about if you're driving in your car and your car goes down to the letter E, that means empty. So David had been going and doing all this stuff. Great things are taking place. He is climbing the mountain. And yet everything around him is now crumbling down until he is now on E. He's on empty. He's got nothing left in him. Now, out of all the places David could have fled, David could have fled, you know, to his dad's house, could have fled back to the prophet, could have went, you know, out to the seashore and took a ship somewhere, could have went up north, could have, could have went a number of places. And yet David goes to Nob. Nob. What is Nob? We don't know Nob. Nob is this obscure little place. And Nob was a high place in the tribe of Benjamin. Now Saul was from Benjamin, right? And so if Saul was looking for David, you would have thought Saul would have started right in his own territory. So David does something very peculiar. He goes to Nob. Why? Because he knew that the temple of God was there in Nob. He knew that the priests were there in Nob. He knew where to run. When his life was running on empty, he knew his need and he knew where he could get fulfilled. He ran to the house of God. He ran to the one place where he knew he could have refuge. He ran to the covering, to the protection, and to the presence of the Lord. See, many times we live life on E. Why? I don't know why. You know, my wife drives me crazy sometimes. Any other men can testify and say a weak amen to this if you're bold enough to. But, you know, doesn't it drive you crazy when your wife is driving the car and all of a sudden the, the, the little gauge goes down to E and the light blinks on and it beeps a noise at her and she goes, oh, we need gas. I think I'll drive home. Amen. To us men, we say, no, it doesn't matter if it's late. It doesn't matter if the kids are hungry. It doesn't matter if I have somewhere to go. I need to get to the gas station because it's on E. But the wife, for some reason, thinks I'm going to drive home. And I'm going to let my husband deal with this tomorrow when he gets in the car and is getting ready to go to work and he's running late and now he gets in the car and says, I'm running late. But it's on E, I have to go to the gas station, okay? Can we be real in this place tonight? It got very quiet and stiff, and I understand those of you men that your wives are sitting next to you, I know you have to go home and go to bed with them tonight, so you don't have, you're, you're off the hook, okay? But thank you for those few brave amens tonight. Amen. But, but, but oftentimes we're like that. We will run ourselves into the ground, and when we are spiritually bankrupt, we'll keep going. Why? Because it seems to work right now. And it's almost as if we don't realize that burnout is right around the corner. I was watching a, a show where there were some people, they were climbing a mountain, and they had a guide with them. And as they're going up the mountain, they got about halfway up. And they're about halfway up. The guide did something very unusual. He took off his pack, broke out a big old thing, a trail mix. And he said something that really stuck with me. It just, it, it, it stayed with me ever since I heard him say, he said, eat if, even if you're not hungry. 
Even if you're not hungry, I want you to eat. And he said, food is fuel. And that stuck with me. Because oftentimes I know personally, I'm just not hungry. I don't want to eat. You know, for, for some of us, it's, it's either famine or feast, right? And for me, I don't live to eat. I eat to live, you know. So it's kind of like that's one of my things is, you know, I'm not hungry. I'm not going to eat. I, I, I don't care to do it. And yet there are times when I know that, you know what, today I'm going out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go do that. And I know that I need energy. And so even if I'm not hungry, I'm going to eat. And in the same way, the, the word of the Lord is speaking to us and telling us, listen, no matter where you're at in life, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you're going, you need to feed. You need to get fueled up. You need to get a new burst of energy. You need to come back into your relation. Come back into the house of God. Come back into the presence of God. Go up to the high place. Go find the priest. Go connect with God. Why? Because you can run on E only so long. You need to refuel in life. Let's learn the lesson from David. You know, I think about my marriage. If I only sat and talked with my wife, connected with my wife, you know, and had conversations with her when it was, a, you know, convenient for me, we wouldn't have much of a marriage. Same way with her. If she only came and sat and listened to my heart and listened to my day and listened to what my concerns were, if she only did that when it was, you know, convenient for her, we wouldn't have much of a marriage. But the fact is, is that every day we try and connect, and sometimes we'll even, you know, try and get a conversation in, or, or oftentimes after the kids have gone to bed and we've brushed teeth and done all that kind of stuff, and now here we are ready to go to sleep, and yet there's something we need to do. We need to connect with one another as husband and wife. We need to talk. We need to communicate. See, with God, God cannot be a convenience. God cannot be only when you're hungry for him. Because let me tell you something, church. Oftentimes, you will not be hungry for the things of God. The flesh will be telling you, you're full. You already got a sermon this morning. You already got something out of the word this week. You've had great times in praise and worship. Why do you need to go to church again? Why do you need to connect with God again? You're already filled up. And yet, we don't realize that we're burning up and that we are burning fuel and that we need to refuel. We need to get into the presence of God. Which brings us to the second thing is get the right fuel. See, David came looking for the common bread. And yet the priest had something to say. The priest said, David, there is no common bread here. See, when you come into the house of God, you are not going to get the wisdom, the ideas, the understanding of man. This is not us coming in to hear from a man's perspective, from philosophies, from traditions, from education systems. Things here on earth, no, that's called the, uh, the elemental principles in the word of God. See, there is a system here on earth. There is a system from the God, lowercase g, of this world and the demonic systems that are in place here on earth. We didn't come in to hear those lies. We came in to hear the reality of the word of truth, the word of life, the word of faith, the word of power. See, we came in not to get the common bread. You can get that common bread anywhere. David could have gone to his dad's house and got bread and cheese. David could have gone down to the store. David could have gone anywhere. People knew David. David could have walked through and told that lie to anybody that he was on a secret mission and give me some common bread. But David was in an uncommon place. David went up to Nob. Nob stands for no other bread. See, there is no other bread in the house of God. There is no common bread in the house of God. You're not going to find the wisdom of this world. No, you are going to find the power and the presence and the word of God here in the house. Got to get the right fuel. See, I know I'm guilty of this too. There's times where pressure comes on, trial comes on, temptation comes on. What do you start doing? You start looking around. I wonder what they think. I wonder what my dad says. I wonder what, you know, my friends will think. I I, I wonder about this. We get online. We look it up on Google. We take a look at our, our Facebook, our Twitter to see what other people are saying about it. We start to search it out. We see maybe there's a TV show about it. Maybe I need to call somebody. Maybe I need a friend. Maybe I even need to talk to a pastor. And yet, God says you've got to get a hold of the right fuel. You get into his presence. You get into his word. You get a hold of the uncommon bread, and now you will have the fuel that you need. What kind of fuel can we expect? Well, words. Words are fuel. I like how Mark Twain said, one compliment can keep me going for a whole month. Praise the Lord. Words are fuel. But did you know that the word of the Lord is a greater fuel than you can ever get out there in the world? Turn me to Jeremiah chapter number 20. Jeremiah chapter number 20. You guys okay? 
Praise God. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse number 9. The prophet's been struggling with the word of the Lord. Here he starts to lament. He starts to speak. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse number 9. Jeremiah speaking. He says, then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He says, I'm, just, I'm not even going to talk. I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to shut up and just let things happen because these people aren't listening. I'm tired. There's a lot of problems. Every time I open my mouth, it seems like something bad happens. So he says, I'm not even going to make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. See, the word of the Lord is a fuel for your life. The more word you get on the inside of you, the more word will fuel you and empower you and come through your life when you don't even expect it or don't even want to try it. You don't even want to make mention of it. No, it is a fire in your heart. Shut up in your bones. And even if you try and hold it back, oh my goodness, you're going to speak the word. You're going to say it. Why? Because you get it in you. It's going to get through you. The word of the Lord is like a fire. It is a fuel. What's another fuel? Well, passions are a fuel. Remember, Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion. Jesus groaning in himself with Lazarus. We heard about this this morning. Here's Jesus, and you can see all throughout his life, he sees them like sheep without a shepherd, and he is moved with compassion. Our passions are our fuels. In life, what is important to you will fuel you. If sports are important to you, you're going to be fueled by sports. You're going to go buy the shirts. You're going to go buy the hats. You're going to go buy the little flags that you put on your cars and drive around looking like the president and all that kind of stuff, you know? You're going to have all that stuff. Our passions are our fuels. And if you have a passion for the word of God, a passion for the things of God, a compassion for the lost, that will move you in your life. But you've got to fuel up on the right things. How about love? Did you know that love is a fuel? Why? Because God is love. And when you get God on the inside of you, and when you start to love people like God loves, all of a sudden you can't help but do. You can't help but move. You can't help but go. You can't help but be moved. See, love is a fuel. I, I, I like 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Now, we know, you know, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. It is not envious. Pastor Jared Wilson in his blog brought out something that if you put 1 Corinthians 13 in reverse, okay, and this was what he wrote about, I thought it was kind of neat how he said it. He said, if, if you were to write this in reverse, it would be this, impatience and unkindness is hatred. Hate is envious and egocentric. Hate is arrogant and rude. Hatred is insisting on one's own way. Hatred is irritable or resentful. It celebrates sin and it mocks what is true. Hate is whiny and thin-skinned, thoroughly skeptical. Skeptical, always pessimistic, a born quitter, but hatred ends. Now you flip that over onto love, and we see that we need to sacrificially give of ourselves in love. And as we start to love, and we allow love to fuel us, and love to move us, and love to motivate us, now all of a sudden, it changes everything in life. Just a couple of, of uh, statements from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In verse number 4, we'll just put it up on the overhead. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4. Love suffers long. See, if love is a fuel, then for those long drives... You want to put love in the tank. Am I right? Why? Because people are stupid. Can we talk? People are going to do dumb things. You're going to be hurting. You're going to have trouble. There's going to be things on your mind. And somebody's going to come by and smile at you and say, isn't it a great day? And you're going to want to smack them. Or, or, or you know, there's going to be something that's painful in your life, and they're just going to bring it up. But if you've got your tank filled with love, love suffers long. Maybe somebody that brings up things over and over and over and over again. You can't endure that on your own, but if your tank is filled with love, if you are fueled by love, love suffers long. Maybe you're working with somebody and trying to bring them to the Lord, and you know, you're encouraging them in the ways of God, and they start to clean up their life, and they start to get their act together. Maybe they even pray a prayer with you. Praise God. But then all of a sudden, they start to go back, and they start to backslide, and they start to revert back to those things. See, in the natural, you could say, well, you know what? I tried. I did my part. I did my thing. You know what? And, and, and now that's, that's just on them. They know better. You know, they made their bed. They can lie in it. But if love suffers long, then maybe you need to have another go. Maybe you need to remind them. Maybe you need to go after them. 
My goodness, see, when love starts to motivate you, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Drop down to verse number seven. Look at this. Love bears all things. Love bears all things. See, we can't handle things on our own. But when you have the supreme power of the universe on the inside of you, God is on the inside of you, and you start operating in the agape love of God, now you can bear up under all things. You've got longevity. You've got strength. You've got sustainable energy on the inside of you. Believes all things. See, sometimes we lose hope. We lose faith. And we think, I can't go any longer. Well, here's the reason why, because you're not filled up on the right kind of fuel. Start filling up on love, and now you can start to believe all things. Hope's all things. See, if you lose hope, you lose it all. Why? Because hope is the blueprint for faith to go to work on. And if you don't have hope, then you can't have faith because faith is the evidence of things hoped for. See, so you have to have hope in order to believe, in order to receive. So God says, fill up on love. And look at this, endures all things. You can go through the trial. You can make it through the test. You can make it through the pain. You can make it through the process. Why? Because you're filled up on the right kind of fuel. Are you listening tonight? Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight. And this is an encouragement to all of us. Fuel was meant to be burned. Fuel was meant to be burned. It's meant to be used. Going back to our illustration of food is fuel, if you think about it, people much smarter than myself have studied this for years and have told us that there is a certain amount of food that you can eat. Different types of food have different amounts. And what do they call that? They call that a calorie, right? And as you burn energy, you burn those calories. So they recommend that a certain number of calories per day a person should eat so that they can fuel their life. I find it very interesting that all throughout the Word of God, it talks about food. All throughout the Word of God, you can find from, from right at the beginning when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he was talking to them about fruit and what you can eat and what you can't eat. Isn't that interesting? Then you fast forward and you had people eating meals together. You had the children of Israel receiving the manna in the wilderness. And, and think about this. Think on this for a second. Talking about fuel was meant to be burned. He who gathered little did not gather too little. He who gathered much did not gather too much. See, sufficient for the day as you get into the presence of God, even if you just get a little taste of the presence of God during the day, even if you just got filled up on a little bit of God's love, see, that will be sufficient for your day. Maybe you got one little verse. Maybe you got one little word from God. Maybe all you have is that it is well that you read in the book of Kings. Maybe that's all that you've got. Maybe all you've got is a God is able. Maybe all you've got is a but God. See, but that's all you need because he who gathered little didn't gather too little, and he who gathered much didn't gather too much. But it was meant to be used. It was meant to be burned. God doesn't want us to just keep filling the tank and never do anything with it. Why? Because overfilling, as you know, when you go to the gas station, can be hazardous to the environment. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? You just lost me. See, Jesus talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were saying, it's not lawful. They had so much of the word and so much of religion and so much of tradition and so much of ritual and so much of we've got all this and we've got the goods that they couldn't even see that David had done something even worse in their eyes and that that was okay in God's eyes. And they had passed up what was truly right and they weren't using it in the right way. They were just getting all filled up. They were just getting all bloated. They were getting all slothful and slow and they became stagnant in their relationship with God. And now they weren't moving forward. They were moving away from God. Even though they could profess with their lips, their hearts were in the wrong place. And so here we find that King David, he received the bread and was giving it to his young men. Why? Because they were going to use it. They were going to be fueled by it. They were going to be moved forward by it. This was a holy bread that was given to them. And now it was going to sustain them and give them strength. We find David later on, here he is, and, and he's encamped in a certain place, and they go off on a raid, and when they come back, all their wives, all their children, everybody is just wiped out. All their goods have been plundered and taken, and they all sit down and have a good cry. Now, I can identify with that. There have been times in my life where I've come, and I've been out doing my thing. I've been out working, been out nose to the grindstone, all that kind of stuff. I come back, and it just seems like I'm wiped out, and I just want to sit down and have a good cry. 
And so here King David is, here is all of his men that are with him, and they're getting ready to kill him. And what does he do? The Bible says he strengthened himself, where? In the Lord. He got a little taste. He got a hold of that fuel from the word of God, and he, he, he inquired of God, said, shall I go after them? God said, go after them. Go get them. Go get your stuff back, David. Go get your women and children back, David. Go on, David. And so David went with the men who, went with, who could go with him, and they all went, and they overtook the raiders, and they wiped them out, and they got everything back. Why? Because that fuel was meant to be burned. All he needed was that right fuel, and then he could go off, and he could use it in the things of God. Jim Elliott, a, a famous missionary who was martyred, said this. He said, God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life that I may burn for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. Uh, one notable evangelist uh, said, I go and I pray and God lights me on fire and people come from all around to watch me burn. See, we need to use that which we've been given. Use all you have while you're here. Spend and be spent. Uh, one author I was just reading named John Acuff, he, he recently said, give the grave nothing but bones. See, that's the kind of life we as Christians ought to live, where we leave nothing, where we spend everything. When we get out of this place, it's completely done. We go crashing into the finish line with no fuel left over. God wants us to receive. Why? So that we can live and we can give and we can do and we can go and we can reach and we can believe and we can receive and we can give and we can go. See, that's the kind of life God wants us to live. Last verse for tonight, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Very familiar verse. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. He knows he's soon going to go and be with the Lord. I'm going to start in verse number 6. It's not going to be up on the overhead, but just read along or listen along. Verse number 7 will be up on the overhead. It says, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Verse number 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. May each and every one of us endeavor in our lives that at the end of our lives we can say, I have fought the good fight. Not the bad fight. Not the losing fight. No, we're going to fight the good fight. I have finished the race. Everything that God asked me to do here on the earth, I did it faithfully. I've finished my course. I have finished the race. And finally, I have kept the faith. I have not backed off God. I have not stopped believing God. I have not quit on God. Why? Because God has not quit on me. I have gotten into the presence of God. What did we learn tonight? We learned about the fuel of life. Number one, we learned that we need to know our need. We need to know when it's time to refuel. We need to go, even if we're not hungry, we need to go through it and get into it. Sometimes we say, oh, that smacks of cold religion. I don't want to have a cold relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, and because of that, you need to eat. You need to get in and get fueled up. Know your needs. Second thing is get the right fuel. Don't fill up on this world's junk. Get a hold of that uncommon holy bread. And finally, fuel was meant to be burned. We need to live our lives in a way that we have nothing left at the end, that we live to give and we go in the power of God with what we have. We have a little bit. That's going to be more than enough. If we got a lot, hey, we can use that too. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. Hey, you guys have been great tonight. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak that word. I want to thank you guys for staying put. You guys have been awesome tonight. I really do believe that you got something out of the word. But let's not stop there. Let's make sure before you leave this place that your heart is right with God. And that if you died, you wouldn't go to hell, but that you would go to heaven. Now, sometimes people hear that talk about hell and they say, ah, oh, I just don't like that. I don't, I don't think God's into that. Well, listen, did you know that in the Bible it talks about hell? It's a very real place. And you can't just deny its existence and it makes it go away. That's like sticking your head in the sand and not expecting to get hit by the wind. It's not going to work. It's like me going on the slow lane of the freeway saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. I can stand there as long as I want to and say that as much as I want. Sooner or later, I'm going to meet one face to face. Can't just deny hell's existence and make it any less real. It's not going to work. The Bible talks about it. Old and New Testament, Jesus talked about it. So let's make sure that your heart is right with God and that you don't go there. See, God doesn't take pleasure when people go to hell. That's not God's intent. God's not some sadistic, mean, cruel God waiting to send people to hell. No, God gives us the free will choice with our life here on the earth. We can choose where we go with our life, whether it be heaven 
or whether it be how. And sometimes people say, well, that's cool because I know that all roads lead to heaven as long as you're into something, you know, and you stay true to yourself, that all roads lead to heaven and, you know, God is good and therefore, you know, it doesn't matter what you do here on the earth. You do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll all get to heaven somehow or another. But do you know the problem with that statement is that nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven. It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. It simply doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible you find it says that all roads lead to heaven. There's one way you got to get there. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You're going to have to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, that's good news because I know that God lets good people into heaven. I've been a good person, done a lot of good throughout my lifetime, you know, been nice to my neighbors, gave money to charity, got involved in social justice and that sort of a thing. And and I've I've been really good. God's going to let me to heaven because I've been good. Done more good than bad, you know, and and, and been really a, a good person. Used to be bad, but cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. God will let me into heaven, right? wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible says you can be good enough to get into heaven? Your goodness compared to God's goodness, the Bible says is like filthy rags. It's going to get thrown out if that's how you're going to try and get into heaven is by your own goodness. Can't make it there on your own goodness because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Sometimes people say, well, wait a second, because I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Born in a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is growing to heaven. Uh, I went to religious classes like Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism class. Parents hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Always considered yourself to be a Christian. Not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven and denying hell. Right? Wrong. You know that nowhere? Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Well, you find that it says that you are raised in church. Your parents tell you Christian. That makes you Christian. Nowhere does it say that you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be born in America, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. I don't find anywhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere. Does it say that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell? Come on, give me a couple more minutes of your attention. I want to talk to you about your eternal life. Let's make sure that you're headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Sometimes people say, well, hold on a second. Not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? Well, no, because you know that nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you Christian. It's like me putting on a Dodger uniform going down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, bringing my bat and my ball, wear the uniform, sit in the dugout, think that I'm going to get to play in the game, calling myself a Dodger. You know what? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a Dodger. No one in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself Christian. That makes you Christian. Sometimes people say, but wait a second, hold on. My last church I got involved. I sang in the choir for a number of years, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, sing in the choir, or even that you get a membership card that God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Listen, I love you enough tonight. Respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Not play games. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You say, but wait a second. I know God. And someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know about Jesus, know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But if you had read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. They're not Christians. You would know the Bible records that the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and yet he's not a Christian, even though he can quote scriptures. We see that in the Bible. So everybody look up at me for a moment. This is not about what you have in your head. It's about, not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to one of those religious leaders, one of the Pharisees who held to the strictest form of the law by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, we know, was a Pharisee. He was a good guy. He could quote more scripture than all of us in this room. He could sing the scripture. My goodness, how many of us could do that? He did a lot of good deeds in his life. We would have thought anybody was qualified for heaven, it would have been this guy, Nicodemus. And yet when Jesus comes and speaks to him, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you've got it going on. Keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. But rather, what does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. But listen, this is not about what society or books or television or movies or Hollywood says about being born again. What does the Bible say about being born again? Well, it's always meant the same thing. The beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible means that you've given God all of your heart. 
and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to this church here tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to the things of God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, come on, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence. No, I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. You might be. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Remember, we're doing this God's way. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up, count, put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. Remember, even if you are, it's better. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He died so that you and I could be forgiven of all of our sins, everything we've ever done wrong. But he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus and given him all your heart and your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in this place if you're lukewarm in your heart? And you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God simply acknowledging your need for Jesus. I'll see your hand go up. Can I put it right back down? Come on. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All across the auditorium, front to back, left to right, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or all around the world on the live stream right now. You can raise your hand. God is watching you. And you can click the blue button if you're online. It says, respond to God. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. There's two. There's three. Who else tonight? Three wise people already. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick? There's three wise people already. Anybody else right over here? I don't see you. Wave it at me if that's you. Thank you. Got you, number four. Number five up in the family room. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? We got five wise people already, and you know you need to give God all of your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. If that's you, just real quick, come on. Go for it. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? You want to give God all of your heart? Want to give God all of your life? Anybody else? I'm going to wrap it up. You're going to miss this opportunity. Don't miss another opportunity in life. God's here and now waiting for you. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Come on, if that's you, you know you need to do this. Come on, let's go. Anybody else real quick? Got five wise people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand. God is good. Now listen, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved when you give God all of your heart and all of your life. So we want to pray with you. We want to get some stuff in your hands that will help you find out what to do next in your walk with God. We want to change destinies with you tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So tonight we're all going to stand as we do. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. So if that's you, no one leave during this time. Let them come forward. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on, come on, come on. If you raise your hand, or you should have. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. Come on down. They'll remember this. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else? Come on. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. Come on. Even if you didn't raise your hand, just make your way to the front right now. 
Nudge your neighbor and say, friend, I'll go with you. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Hey, you guys up front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, you go to church sometimes, you wonder if they're weird. Listen, you already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you absolutely free some information, a little booklet our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. You need to find out what to do next in your walk with God. This little booklet will help you to find out how, how do I become a Christian? How do I do this? How, how do I start in my walk with God? Okay? You need to find that out. Listen, probably take you 20, 30 minutes if you sit down and read it slow. Okay? We invest a lot of time into movies, television, phone conversations, video games, books, all that kind of stuff. You can invest maybe a half hour to sit down and find out what to do next in your walk with God. Then finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church called a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym? Helps you get strong, helps you get buff, right? That sort of thing. Make sure you're eating the right things. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Basically, let me water it all down. It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy and it's free and you need to do it. And then after he explains that to you, he'll let you come right back out, okay? Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Give us one year of your life. One year sitting under the word of God here at the Rock Church, okay? And at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, you will be so blessed that you'll say, man, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, so if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.